Thank you for joining us for the Recover Colorado News Conference. We have six presenters today who will each give a short two or three minute statement. Following that, we will take questions. Our presenters will be Carol Hedges, Executive Director of the Colorado Fiscal Institute, Tiffany Lennon, Executive Director for the Colorado Center on Law and Policy, Amy Baca Olert, President of the Colorado Education Association. Julie Riskin, Executive Director for the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Mary Putnam, Executive Director and Founder for Reciprocity Collective. And Karen Fox Elwell, Chief Executive Officer for Growing Home. Um, good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning um, and joining this incredible effort um, of advocates from all across the state uh, to come together to help uh, Colorado recover from the health um, emergency that, that we're all experiencing. Um, there are, as we all know, um, if we've been paying any attention to what's going on at the Capitol building, that there are unprecedented revenue implications that are stemming from this unprecedented health emergency. Uh, over $3 billion in shortfalls um, is what is um, anticipated um, um, as, uh, the, as the budget writers um, try to come together and figure out how to balance a budget. Um, the problem is that those shortfalls will simply compound the impacts of this uh, health crisis for Colorado communities. And Recover Colorado is about doing everything we can to avoid making it harder for Coloradans and their communities um, to get back on their feet. Um, state dollars, as we know, buy services and they buy jobs. And the benefits of those services provide health care and education, recreation, and add quality of life for all parts of the state. And the wages that are paid by those state jobs support restaurants and gas stations and doctor's offices and retail operations of all kinds as well. We believe our elected officials have an obligation to explore all op op uh, options to avoid and or mitigate the impact of these state budget cuts. And one of those, and an emergency tax, is an option that's provided by Colorado's uh, constitutional Tabor Amendment to help communities deal with the impact of emergencies in situations just exactly like this. Um, the, the, it has never been used, um, the emergency tax provision of Tabor, and that's primarily because the underlying emergencies uh, emergency that would trigger a, uh, a, an emergency tax through Tabor can't be economic in nature. And if you think back about the other times in which there's been an, often a need for uh, a, the state um, to have more resources to address the impacts of, of, uh, of an emergency, they've often been economic or functionings of the market economy in some way. The emergency now and here is a health emergency. That health emergency has economic consequences. And it's exactly the kind of situation, it's the kind of limited situation um, that has been, um, uh, that, that the provision in Tabor was uh, uh, really suited and best suited to address. Um, it is a very limited option um, as out outlined in the amendment in the constitution. In order for an emergency tax to be adopted, it would require a two-thirds vote um, to declare the health emergency and enact a temporary tax. The tax would only be in effect through the end of November of 2020. Um, it will also require that the it also requires that the General Assembly spend down the emergency reserve um, that it designates each year, mm. and this too will require. Um, uh, additions require legislative action. Um, this is a, a challenging and difficult time and it requires a new and um, uh, innovative responses. Um, the, this group, um, Recover Colorado, is working to better understand what steps are needed. Um, that work is in order to be able to implement such attacks and that work is continuing. Um, but we feel like we must all do what we can to avoid or mitigate the budget cuts um, that will make the recovery for Colorado and our communities across the state even more difficult. Carol, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, 
Let's hear from Tiffany Lennon, the Executive Director for Colorado Center on Law and Policy. Thank you, Angela, and thank you everyone who is making the time today to join us at this press conference. This is really important. We are certainly in an unprecedented time and it calls for an unprecedented reaction. I want to un underscore a couple of things that Carol has, has talked about. First, we are representative of communities throughout Colorado. There are 136 organizations and counting, frankly, uh, that have son signed on to this three-pronged approach that we're advocating for. And these organizations are not only representative of the Front Range, but they're representative throughout Colorado on the Western Slope as well. This is truly a collaborative effort. Um, and, and folks are coming together because they recognize how important this really is and, and what the circumstances are facing Colorado. And frankly, these circumstances are not only going to be an issue for this year, 2020, but we're going to be looking at consequences for 21 and 22 as well. As Carol mentioned, uh, the state is looking at about a three and a half billion dollar deficit. We're suggesting that there's a three prong approach. One, we need some federal advocacy, some dollars from the federal government to help reduce that deficit. We need also to use the provision in the Tabor Amendment that would allow us to uh, tap uh, an emergency tax structure that is temporary. Um, we're suggesting a, a tax income that would really be targeted for people that are earning $250,000 a year and above, right? And there would even be a, a minor tax break for those earning under $250,000. So this is a really reasonable, common sense approach. Um, and it's temporary. I cannot emphasize that enough. It is temporary. So for those Coloradans that are privileged to have earned $250,000 or more um, a year, those folks, um, this is their opportunity to give back. This is their opportunity to help uh, stem this crisis that we're facing. Uh, and it is a health crisis that has tremendous economic consequences, not only for this year, but for the coming year as well, coming years. And so I, I also want to remind people that we already have Coloradans that are suffering. And, you know, I think many folks think Colorado's doing so well, we're thriving, and that is true for a lot of Coloradans. But for many Coloradans, folks are still experiencing, even before this, the COVID crisis, folks are experiencing really difficult economic times. Um, and we need to not decimate them further. We need to be particularly aware of these consequences for people of color and for rural communities throughout Colorado. Now is not the time for us to cut programs that will just further delay an economic recovery of this state. And history tells us that drastic budget cuts will only further delay the economic recovery of the state, not to mention the health and well-being of Coloradans. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Tiffany. Let's hear from uh, Amy baca Olert next, who is the president of the Colorado Education Association. Thank you so much. Um, yep, yeah, my name is Amy baca Olert. I am the president of the Colorado Education Association and we represent over 39,000 educators who do the noble job of educating Colorado's youth every single day. Um, you know, when we think about what's ahead for K-12 education um, in this current reality, I think we have to look at, um, at where we were in K-12 education and the the stark picture that was already painted for K-12 education. Um, K-12 has not recovered from the last recession. In fact, over the la last decade, um, there has been over $8 billion in underfunding of our public schools, which has led to major consequences for students and for communities. We are seeing right now um, just how important our public schools are to our communities. Not only do our schools educate students but for many of our students, they are also the, it's the only place where they receive a warm meal during the day. Um, our school communities right now have had to do tremendous things to provide food to families in need. Um, they oftentimes provide healthcare 
um, to students. Um, and in many instances, they are the only warm, safe place that our students have during the day. So our schools are so vital to our communities. And unfortunately, prior to COVID-19, Colorado had some statistics for our public schools that we should not be proud of. Um, Colorado underfunds, um, it's, as I said, it's schools um, every year through the budget stabilization factor. This year alone, that amount was $572 million. Um, and what that means is that um, we're funding our students $2,700 below the national average in per pupil funding. Um, we have the largest wage gap in the country. We have a massive educator shortage. Um, our students don't have adequate mental health supports. While Colorado has the largest, um, unfortunately, the highest youth suicide rate in the country. Uh, we have large class sizes. There really is no room for further cuts. So what will these further cuts mean to our K-12 schools? It will mean that the, all of these problems will get worse. Already, more than half of the school districts in Colorado are on a four-day week. We cannot afford to have further cuts to our public school system. Our students deserve better, our communities deserve better, and this is why the CEA is supporting the emergency tax measure, because it is temporary relief that is so needed for our students. We know that when our students come back in the fall, they are going to have significant needs. Many students are experiencing trauma, and if they are not experiencing some of the trauma that comes from things like food insecurity, homelessness, we are experiencing a collective trauma by living through the experience that we are living through right now. And we need to ensure that our public schools have adequate staff to support students and also to meet the health and safety requirements that will need to be in place. Um, we believe that if there is a chance to do something to provide a safety net, to provide protections, and to enable our students to have health and safe learning environments, and the educators who serve them to have safe and healthy working environments, then we absolutely should do every single thing that we can. And this is an opportunity for our elected officials to do the right things for our students, for our public school systems, as well as our communities across Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Let's go to Julie Riskin, who is the Executive Director for the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Julie Riskin with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. We are a statewide organization and represent people with all types of disabilities of all ages. As someone who's been doing this public policy advocacy on disability issues in Colorado for more than a quarter of a century, I've reflected on the past economic downturns and recovery periods. In the 30 years that our organizations existed, we've never once taken a position that we need to raise taxes, um, temporarily or permanently, never. Um, we um, have always taken the position that we can be smarter and we've proposed options to use services better. Um, for example, by having consumer-directed personal health care, we cut out the middleman and got the money directly to the workers. A lot of those changes have been made. Um, there have been a lot of other financial things. Some people call them gimmicks. People call them other things. All of the things that could be done have been done over the, la over the past several um, economic crises that we've had in our state. Um, so there isn't $3 billion worth left to do. So what do we do? How, where do we go from here? What I've been talking about and our community has been talking about is instead of trying to quote unquote get back to normal, um, or get back to what was, we need to reimagine the state that we want to have. What we had wasn't equitable for too many, and it didn't work for many people, as, as uh, Ms. Lemon mentioned. We can't continue to act in silos. Um, each of us has a job. Um, other, other organizations like ours represent a specific population. However, and we have to do that. But more importantly, we have to come together and think of ourselves, our organizations, even those with whom we think we have nothing in common, and our communities is interrelated and connected because we're one state. If we try and cut more than $3 billion, Colorado will be a place that works for no one. 
and we can't do that. This is not just about healthcare and human services. I think some of us that talk about this a lot live in those spaces. This is about everything and everyone. And so our call is really to focus on a Colorado that includes everyone and works for everyone. And we can do that, but we can't do it without this emergency tax. And then some ongoing creative thinking beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, let's hear from Mary Putnam, the executive director and founder of Reciprocity Collective. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Mary Putman with the Reciprocity Collective. And I appreciate being able to add our voice to the other voices on this call. As Julie mentioned, um, we all represent different sectors of um, the people that we that maybe use human services or that we serve. But collectively, uh, we share more than we have differences. <clears throat> Reciprocity Collective works in communities of poverty and homelessness, and we have a very collaborative model of employment support and, and also case management support that we coordinate with other human service agencies. Um, and while we all know that COVID-19 is something that affects the entire society, um, we have seen, those of us who work in the community, have seen uh, a deeper divide between the, the higher income and the lower income individuals of, of, of Colorado. <clears throat> Statistically, um, for the folks who have filed for unemployment, 40% of the folks filing for unemployment are coming from households that earn $40,000 or less. <clears throat> Only 19% of folks filing for unemployment are falling between the $40,000 to $100,000 per year, and only 13% are over $100,000 per year. So as we can see, it is the unemployment rate is dis disproportionately affecting low-income individuals. <clears throat> the individuals that we work with in supporting in employment often are coming out of homelessness or newly housed and have not yet been able to find financial stability in that process. And this particular crisis has certainly hit them very hard. As we look at the needs that will need to continue to have beyond this crisis and into what we like to call recovery. And I think we can all very fairly say we're not quite sure exactly what that's going to look like or how long that lasts. But you know, economic forecasts tell us it could be up to two years before employment rates reach what they were pre-COVID, if they even reach that point. And so we're going to see increased need for food support, rental assistance and housing, support with childcare as we try to help folks get back to work, um, supports with me, uh, community mental health and recovery services, and, and obviously in employment. And we, we believe that the process of bringing more income, more revenue into the budget in order to support these uh, initiatives that people are so reliant upon is very important. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, let's finish it up with Karen Fox Elwell, who is the CEO of Growing Home. Great. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, as Angela mentioned, I'm Karen Fox Elwell at Growing Home. Um, we are a community based organization with a vision of our entire community coming together and so ensuring that our families have a place to call home, food on the table, and opportunities to pursue their dreams. And at Growing Home, we're focused on strong and resilient families and thriving and equitable communities. We predominantly work with low-income families, predominantly from the Latino community. Um, and COVID-19 um, and the crisis has been particularly devastating to our community, who was already facing hardships prior to this crisis. Um, this COVID has disproportionately been impacting the Latino community in terms of higher infection rates, um, jobs losses, uh, the digital divide and language barriers that are impeding families being able to support the education of their children during this time of, of remote learning. And we've also seen mental health impacts in our community that have been caused by the social isolation and social distancing. 
Um, we believe firmly with our co my colleagues that have spoken before that there are a lot of collaboration happening amongst the community to serve these families. However, drastic cuts to programs and the safety nets that these families rely on will be even more devastating and will continue to deteriorate the conditions in these communities and the hard work that has been built over the past years. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to address um, this group. Thank you, Karen, very much. Um, we're gonna go back to Elliot and um, as I just put in a chat in here, if you have questions that you'd like to present, please put your name in there. I do know we have a question from Kyler, but I'm gonna see if there's anything Elliot wants to bring around. No, I think um, I think everybody's got, got it going. Um, I wanted to just say thank you so much to all of our presenters uh, for sharing your perspectives and talking about how important um, what is ahead is to your communities and to the people that you serve. Um, and really for the entire state of Colorado. And that's why we're all here today to, um, to talk about uh, some solutions uh, beyond just um, what sort of what's been uh, the conventional wisdom presents us. So uh, I think we're gonna go with the first question with uh, Kyler from the Greeley Tribune. Hey guys, uh, thanks for uh, having me on this. Um, wondering, and uh, I, I'm looking briefly through uh, the release that you sent and, and my notes here, and Wondering if you've got some numbers on what you anticipate, uh, what you're proposing to, to raise. You say there's about a, uh, what is it, three three point five bill or three billion dollar shortfall. Um, wh what do we anticipate raising uh, if we uh, were to enact this tax that, that you're proposing, this emergency tax on folks over two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year? Um, Angela, I'd be happy to take that question. Um, so thanks, Kyler. Thanks for being on the call today. And it's a great question. Um, the proposal that um, is being considered now, the, 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 the proposal that would um, uh, incre create an emergency tax on income above $250,000 would have prior to the COVID um, sort of economic collapse would have raised about $2 billion annually. Um, now, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, it's a temporary tax. It will probably be, it would probably be only be in place for a portion of that time. So I think a realistic expert, um, um, understanding of the amount of money that would be raised would be about $700, $750 million, which of course won't completely eliminate um, cuts, but if you add that to the federal funds that are, um, have been, um, already allocated to the spending, the, the responsible spending down of some of our reserves, as well as some of the rescissions and things that have already happened. Um, it would be a really good, it, it would be a way to share and spread the costs of, uh, uh, of, the, of the health crisis more fairly and more equitably uh, uh, across everyone. Looks like Angela might be having some technical difficulties. Um, I think our next question in the queue here is, uh, and then and then we'll get to Ed's question that he typed out, is uh, Bill Lucia with Route 50. Uh, yeah, hi guys, thanks for taking my question. Um, I actually, I, I, have a, I have three questions here and I'll just ask them all at once. Um, so the, the first is, I wonder if you could tell me what the, the rates would be in the, the press release mentioned a, a bracketed increase. So, uh, are there going to be different rates for people making different levels above 250,000? And what would those rates be? And same for the slight decrease you mentioned for people making less than that amount. Um, and then the, the other question I have is, could you just uh, clarify a little bit, um, when it comes to having to spend down the rainy day fund, what, what is the like? What are the guidelines there? Why does that have to happen? And what exactly has to happen with the state uh, budget reserves in order for this to to this proposal to work? And then lastly, um, and, and this is less of a technical question. Um, in recent years, I mean, Colorado voters have been pretty skeptical of the polls when it comes to to um, you know making changes to the Tabor or you know other other sorts of tax increase measures. So what makes you think that this situation will be different um, in terms of building support for what you're proposing here? 
you know, Bill, if you don't mind, I'll start. And I know Carol has some other um, comments to make as well. But this, this proposal will require two thirds of our legislative body to pass. Um, and if you look at recent polls uh, among Coloradans, they actually support a tax increase for the top percent, right? So, so for the majority, 96% of Coloradans um, would not experience a tax increase. So I think that's a really important point. And those in the top 4%, it's a, it's a modest, staggered um, uh, rate um, change for, for those uh, that are earning 250 and above. Um, and, and so it's, I think the question is, I think Coloradans are there. I think the question is, are the lawmakers, they're faced with this, you know, very difficult decisions and, you know, I don't envy them. Uh, but really, it's a matter of whether or not the lawmakers are, are willing to really hear from Coloradans and because over 60% of Coloradans would support a measure like this from a recent poll. Um, and so we know that, you know, folks are, are supportive of common sense approaches. You know, I think it's just really a matter of if the lawmakers have the political will um, to really take a stand and say, hey, this is, this is something that we need to do. And it is temporary, right? We're, I mean, it would be set to expire at the end of November of this year. Um, and for 700, 750 a uh, million dollars, it, it seems like that would uh, be a reasonable approach. I will, jump in, yeah. um, I will jump in to provide sort of a, it, some insight into the rates that the, again, this is, you know, the legislature hasn't begun to debate this proposal yet, and you know, there may be additional changes or adaptations, but the proposal that upon which the estimate of 700, 750 million dollars is based would be a rate increase for, uh, it would be a reduction in the rate um, on the first $250,000 from 4.63% to 4.58%. For income between 250 dollars and $500,000, it would be an increase to 7%. From 500 to a, thousand, to a million, it would be 7.7%. And for income in excess of a million dollars, it would be 8.9%. I want to touch briefly on the spend down issue. Uh, Colorado doesn't have a rainy day uh, account, um, which is another one of those odd things about um, the constraints that are placed upon our legislators' ability to manage the finances of the state of Colorado. But what we do have is um, a, a, requ a constitutional requirement of an emergency reserve, which is um, equal to 3% of uh, what we collect in fees and taxes, um, as well as a statutory reserve that is equal to 7.25% of the general fund budget or the tax collections each year. What would, what's required by the Tabor Amendment to be spent down is that amount equal to um, the 3% of taxes and cash funds. So it's about a little over $440 million. Got it. Thanks, uh, thanks for those responses, you guys. Um, and I... I, I would love to really underscore Tiffany's point about um, sort of the recent, um, I mean, we're just in a different situation we've ever been in before. Um, I, I just, it's just hard to imagine um, a quicker change in an economic circumstance than we've seen now. Um, and I think that the, the most recent polling um, I've seen around this that, that Tiffany talked about is that 68% of Coloradans prefer this, met, this option of increasing taxes on um, higher incomes to, to the kinds of cuts that are being proposed. And the thing I think that's the most uh, interesting and um, unusual about that data is that that is true regardless of political affiliation. Um, unaffiliated voters, uh, Democratic voters, and Republican voters all prefer um, this measure, the, uh, this, this sort of temporary approach um, to, or, or this sort of approach um, to making the kinds of cuts that are, would be required. 
Hey, Carol. Um, so uh, Ed Sealover with the Denver, Denver Business Journal typed this question out. Um, he's asking about Colorado Concern has filed a lawsuit to overturn uh, the governor's decision to expand access to the ballot by initiative signature gatherers. Um, he says, I know that uh, that would affect some efforts being put forth by this group for the 2020 ballot. Do you have a reaction to that? And without the governor's order, how much more difficult would it be to get a measure like the uh, separate uh, fair tax proposal onto the November ballot? Um, I'll take the first shot at this one and, and I would love it if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, first of all, the measure that you're referring to, Ed, it's good. Hi, haven't seen you in a while. Um, the, uh, the measure that you're referring to is actually um, the Fair Tax Colorado measure, which is a, uh, which has the same outlines as we've described in, as the temporary tax measure. Um, and I guess, you know, um, I think it's it's a, it would be again adding to an already really difficult situation if um, voters weren't given the opportunity to to weigh in on a measure that is as popular and as important um, as 271 is both to the short term and the long term recovery and um, uh, uh, economic stability of the state of Colorado. Um, I think that. Uh, you know the the 270 the the Fair Tax Colorado um, organization um, has is built on the idea of of support from all parts of the state through volunteer signature gathering. Um, certainly makes it more challenging if it uh, with the the current state of our um, safer at home uh, measures. I think I know that the Fair Tax Colorado is still moving forward to collect signatures. We have a ton of really great and innovative volunteers that are figuring out all kinds of ways um, to connect and uh, collect signatures now. Um, I think that the provisions that were outlined in the governor's executive order would help allow the voices of Coloradans to be most effectively heard by putting this measure on the ballot. Um, but I feel confident that um, regardless of what happens, there's a, there's real people power behind Fair Tax Colorado, um, and that that the ballot that the measure will um, still be able to qualify for the ballot. Um, our next question, Carol uh, Leslie asked it, but um, Kyler had a follow up, uh, and it sounds like he had the same question, which is, um, what are you hearing from legislators on this and getting to the two thirds majority that's required? Uh, lawmakers have been made aware of this particular proposal um, today and um, and over the weekend uh, in addition to the uh, governor's office and so you know I think there are some folks that feel like it's it's uh, possible to get there right and there are some folks that feel like you know it's not going to happen um, I can tell you this though it would be it just wouldn't be responsible if we didn't at least have this conversation and and discuss this as a viable option. And the 136 organizations that have come together are asking lawmakers to put this on the table as a viable option. Uh, it's it, it wouldn't be responsible not to do so. And I know that lawmakers are are just as challenged by this as we are. Right? No one wants to see Colorado. Uh, become decimated by the health crisis and then the economic consequences that result. You know, I want to underscore something that Julie mentioned early on in her talking point. She mentioned that CCDC doesn't typically weigh in on, uh, and forgive me, Julie, if I'm uh, misrepresenting what you said, but I understood you to say that typically CCDC doesn't, doesn't weigh in on issues like this. Well, neither does CCLP, neither does the Center on Law and Policy. Um, and so, but we are now because it is our responsibility to do so, right? It, I mean, it, it just really is. And, and I believe that a lot of folks in Colorado, particularly those higher wage earners, those top 4%, uh, the folks that I've been talking to have been uh, very supportive of this initiative. We have been uh, getting the word out. We have been um, coordinating a, a large group of folks around the state. And, and folks think it just makes sense. Um, and so... Yeah, I think right now we're hearing a bit of a mixed bag, but um, you know, it's it, it's possible. And this is Amy uh, um, from CEA. I'll just jump in on that as well. I think that um, 
Yes, would absolutely agree that, um, you know, these conversations are just beginning. Um, we actually look forward to, to having these conversations with our legislators to help them understand um, and, and to have the political courage to, to have these um, discussions and to bring this forward. I think most legislators are very aware of the pain that their communities are experiencing, of the, um, the reality of the pain that will, will exist um, based on the level of cuts that they are talking about. Um, when you talk about $3.3 billion needing to be cut from the, the general fund budget, um, that has real consequences for Coloradans and for our communities. Um, and actually, this is an opportunity for legislators to have something to do to provide relief. Um, so we, we view this as an opportunity to, to help our elected officials um, to have a, a, a path forward instead of having to talk only about just the devastating cuts that are going to come out of this situation. This actually provides a path forward and a way for them to help be a part of the solution to provide relief to the Coloradans who are hurting so bad right now. I think it's important to note as well that the framers of Tabor anticipated, right, that such a crisis could happen right? What we're proposing is exactly in alignment with Tabor, right? I mean, that's the irony of it, right? Folks talk about Tabor as this, as, as this demon, right? Uh, sometimes, right? Because um, we're so hamstrung by it. But in this case, Tabor is actually providing the mechanism for us to actually make this happen, right? Tabor specifically says, if there's a, a health crisis of this uh, proportion that we need a different kind of mechanism that taxpayers um, don't have to vote on it, right? That we can, that the, the legislative body can pass a temporary measure with two thirds the vote. So I just want to point out that it is Tabor that has offered us the solution. Yeah, th this is Julie Riskin and, and I, I wanted to be clear that this is a piece of it. Um, I know in the disability community, we're not asking, we're not saying that only the high income people should pay. This is after everything else that we've tried. The first thing we did when we were aware is we talked in our community, most of us do rely on Medicaid and said, what can we do? What can we give? We suggested doubling our Medicaid co-pays. We suggested uh, reducing by a third some of our benefits. Um, uh, particularly dental because we didn't want it to go away for everyone and so uh, so a lot of people on the lower income are are giving also so this is not just one group gives for everyone else we all give and there are going to have to be a lot of cuts even with this so I just wanted to make sure that that was really clear so uh, Kyler from the Greeley Tribune asked what what is the mechanism uh, that this gets discussed in the legislature um, is it like a bill or a resolution and how uh, and, and do we have legislators that are uh, ready to, to propose it? Um, so when it gets to the nerdy technical stuff, that's when I get to jump in. Um, <laughs> um, the uh, it does require. Well, we assume it requires a bill again, as I as we as everybody's talked about, this has never been used before, but um, Based upon the work that's been done up to this point, um, yes, it looks like it would require a bill. There would be a, a require a bill to declare a health emergency and to impose a tax. Um, there would the either in that bill or in a separate piece of legislation, there would has to be the designation of um, the spending down of the emergency reserve, which is going to require its own um, set of activities. Um, and at this point, you know, we, we've begun these conversations with legislators. This is a relatively new concept. They are just beginning to get, um, become aware of um, the, the magnitude of the, of the reductions that, that are going to be required. I think one of the things that's so different about this circumstance is that in prior um, um, recessions, we talked about, we did some pretty dramatic things. The state of Colorado had to come together to do a series of pretty dramatic things. And the Joint Budget Committee released a series of recommendations to try to get the ballot that, that could help get the budget in balance. And it was a series of dramatic things. And what struck me is that it wasn't like they got the option to pick and choose. It was that they were all going to have to be adopted in order to meet, to get the um, expenses to align with um, income. 
So we, um, we're just now beginning, you know, we're working with and talking to legislators about the, um, how they see this situation. Um, and so we're working now to try to get all the questions answered um, and to find the, the, the right set of legislative champions. Thank you uh, to everybody who was able to make it. If you have follow-up questions, please send them my way. I'll be happy to connect you with uh, the folks who are on the call today. And um, really, we really appreciate everybody from media, everybody from advocacy organizations, and I especially want to thank our presenters um, who were able to talk about this issue with clarity and depth, and we really appreciate that.